C is for car, the automobiles, and nothing is cooler than a boss set of wheels. From selling some cars, this man made a horde. Mechanic and boss man, here's Henry Ford. I'm Indy Nidell, and this is the World Dictionary, today featuring Henry Ford. Ford, you probably know, was the guy that gave his name to the Ford automobile and was the founder of the Ford Motor Company. But was he also a dick? We'll see in a minute. He was born in Michigan in 1863 and was already showing serious mechanical aptitude by his teens, repairing watches for his neighbors. By 1882, he worked on the family farm and with the Westinghouse farm engine, which is not a 90s band, but an actual machine. Ford serviced the machines, which were portable steam engines that were hauled from farm to farm to give power where power was needed. He studied bookkeeping, married Clara Jane Bryant in 1888, and had a son named Edsel in 1893. The Ford Motor Company would actually one day make a car called the Edsel that would be hyped as the car of the future and would turn out to be one of the biggest marketing failures in American history, but neither Henry nor Edsel would be around to see that. Introducing the new taste of Coca-Cola, the best Coca-Cola ever. That's all I'm going to say. In fact, that's all I have to say. No more words. The McBLT. I'm talking quarter pound of beef on the hot, hot side. And the hot stays hot. The new McBLT. Yeah, they wouldn't see those things either. Ford became an engineer at Thomas Edison's Illuminating Company and was soon chief engineer. This meant he had the money and the time to do his own experiments with gasoline engines. This resulted in the Ford Quadricycle, finished in 1896. It had four bicycle wheels. Hence, quadricycle. Ford actually met Edison that year, and Edison encouraged his experiments. This led to Ford leaving Edison, which I'm sure made Edison real happy, and forming the Detroit Automobile Company in 1899. This company did not succeed. So Ford formed the Henry Ford Company in 1901 with himself as chief engineer. It was shaky enough, though, that Henry Leland was brought in to oversee liquidation. Ford left the company. Leland prevented the liquidation, and the Ford-less company was rechristened Cadillac. So now you know how that started. Leland would apply things like using interchangeable parts in different cars, which you'd think would be a no-brainer, but you'd be wrong since cars then were still handmade rich person toys. Anyhow, Ford built the 999 racing car, which ace driver Barney Oldfield drove to victory in October 1902 and even set a new land speed record at 91 miles per hour. And then Ford started the partnership Ford and Malcolmson Limited, which was reincorporated as the Ford Motor Company in 1903. In 1908, Ford introduced the Model T. The steering wheel was on the left, as was not always the case at the time because things were not standardized then, but all the other companies eventually followed suit. Now this car was easy to drive. Ford created a huge PR machine and he set up a network of local dealerships that put Ford cars in every US city. Sales skyrocketed and there were even years when annual sales were double the previous years. It was a global success story. The Model T was already cheap compared to other cars, but in 1915, Ford introduced moving assembly belts in his plants, which dramatically increased production and lowered costs. A car that cost $825 in 1908 cost $360 in 1916. That's like $8,000 today. By 1918, half of all cars in the United States were Model Ts, and all the new cars were black. Now, you may have heard Ford's quote, any customer can have a car painted in any color he wants, so long as it's black. I don't know why I did that accident, but well, anyhow, the all black thing came after the assembly line because the black paint dried quicker. Before that, there were other colors, including red. By 1927, when production stopped, 15 million Model Ts had been produced. Ford finally released a second model, the Model A, that year. Ford ran for Senate as a Democrat and a peace candidate in 1918, but lost. He also did a bit of trickery to convince the Ford shareholders to sell their stock, and he and Edsel managed to get the family sole ownership of Ford Motors. He was one of the richest men in the world by this time and was an early proponent of welfare capitalism. In 1914, he introduced the $5 a day wage, which was double the standard. Thing is, this brought the best mechanics permanently to Ford, which cut training costs and increased productivity. Other companies had to match the wage hike or lose their employees. Ford workers could now also afford the things, the cars, that they were building. By the late 1920s, he had introduced a five-day, 40-hour work week, which was also pretty novel. He began a profit-sharing program for employees that qualified, and he had a team of dozens of investigators to weed out the gamblers and drunks from those who did. Needless to say, his intrusion into the private lives of his employees was controversial. But still, this guy doesn't sound like a dick at all, does he? I mean, 
He seems pretty up and up. Well, he didn't like labor unions. Now, there are lots of people who don't like labor unions, but most of them do not hire former boxers to head their security department and use intimidation tactics to stop union organizing. This led to things like the Battle of the Overpass, when Ford Security attacked United Auto Workers organizers. As many as 40 men attacked and beat the organizers, which included Richard Frankenstein, who I'm mentioning for obvious reasons, and even broke one guy's back. The Detroit News managed to get photos of this, page one news nationwide, and Ford's reputation really suffered. Ford opposed both world wars, thinking they were the product of greedy financiers. If you wonder whom he meant by that, he meant Jews. And he continued to do business with Nazi Germany, including manufacturing war material. In fact, in 1940, when Ford Werke began using French POWs as slave labor, he was breaking the Geneva Convention. The U.S. still had diplomatic ties with Germany at the time, and Ford Werke was still controlled by Ford and Ford Motors. However, when the U.S. joined the war, the Ford company got behind it and built the largest assembly line in the world, which produced 9,000 B-24 heavy bombers, half the total number produced. But the Ford company was run by Edsel then, though Henry took over some duties after Edsel died in 1943. But the anti-Semitism thing had followed him for a while. In the early 1920s, Ford sponsored the Dearborn Independent, a weekly paper with strong anti-Semitic views. Every American Ford franchise was required to distribute it. He became a spokesman for right-wing extremism and said things like, if fans wish to know the trouble with American baseball, they have it in three words, too much Jew. The Independent even reprinted the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a fabricated text that had already been debunked describing Jewish plans for global domination. The Independent was issued in Germany as the International Jew, the world's foremost problem, which is a really bad translation of the Independent. Heinrich Himmler described Henry Ford as one of their most valuable fighters. He is the only American mentioned in Hitler's Mein Kampf, and Hitler wrote that he was the only great man who remained independent from the Jews in America. Hitler told the Detroit News in 1931 that Ford was his inspiration, which explains the life-size portrait of Ford next to Hitler's desk. Uh, the Volkswagen was modeled on the Model T. In 1938, Ford received the Grand Cross of the German Eagle, Nazi Germany's highest award for a foreigner. Ford would claim in a libel lawsuit that he didn't know the contents of the Independent, but employees of the Independent swore under oath that this was not so, and Ford's friends found it impossible to swallow that the paper could be published without Ford's approval. His anti-Semitism did affect sales, and Ford issued a public apology when he shut down the paper. According to Poole and Poole in their book about who financed Hitler's rise to power, Ford's retraction and apology, though, were not even really signed by him, and even as late as 1940, he apparently Currently stated, I hope to republish the international Jew at some time. At the Nuremberg trials, Hitler youth leader Balder von Schirach stated, the decisive anti-Semitic book I was reading and the book that influenced my comrades was that book by Henry Ford. I read it and became anti-Semitic. Henry Ford died in 1947 of a cerebral hemorrhage. Okay, and so we come to the scale to see what kind of a dick he really was. On the scale of achievements, he does pretty well. He was an automotive pioneer. He made what was then the best-selling car ever. He pioneered things like assembly lines. He did good by his workers with the $5 wage and the 40-hour week. However, he also used slave labor suborned physical violence and intimidation to prevent labor unions, investigated his employees' private lives, sponsored an anti-Semitic newspaper. That's still like two out of three on the scale. And as for being a dick, there's that anti-Semitism thing hanging over his head. I mean, I mean, Hitler had a life-size portrait of him, and both Hitler and Himmler saw him as an inspiration. At least one other leading Nazi says he became anti-Semitic directly because of Ford. Uh, Ford republished the Protocols of Zion, knowing they were forged. Now that's not looking so good, and though Ford may have been naive about the Nazis, there's nothing naive about slave labor and anti-Semitism. But Ford wasn't directly a dick on, on an industrial scale like the Nazis, which is somewhat mitigating. So I'll give him a 2.5 since his dickishness still had a big effect on the world, right? Giving him an overall 2.25, which makes him a first class dick. Yeah, uh, hey, but hey, at least he made a car most people could afford. 
That's it for today. If you know of any dicks throughout history that we should talk about, let us know who they are in the comments, and please tell us why. And remember, living people do not count. Do not forget to subscribe to never miss a single letter of the alphabet, and hey, don't be a dick.